Now, the big news is that Andrew Zimmerman has come back from China. Hello, everyone. You know, this is uh, between the two possibilities. This is a much better one. Um, he's back here in Hawaii, uh, and uh, he's here on the show. Welcome to the show, Andrew. Nice to see you. Thank you very much for having me, Jay. It's good to be back in Hawaii. Well, you went to China. You spent a couple of years teaching English in China. Is and that... my first question is why? Why? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, there's two things to it, I think. Uh, the first thing is I had long had this obsession with China, for probably since I was like five years old. I was, I remember Bond was the, uh, was my favorite movie. And, um, you know, I figured as soon as I got out of college, there's only so long you can make a, you can make a, have a chance to live abroad. And China seemed like the really good place to do it. Um, just because it's a really happening place. The political situation is really interesting. And, you know, I know when I'm in my like late twenties, early thirties, you're probably going to start about thinking, of start thinking about, am I going to have a family? And that's going to be really hard to do something crazy, like live abroad. So I wanted to get it done as quickly as I could. And I ended up making a really good choice and picking a good time to go. You know, I think so many people I know have actually had that same thought. And China has been so exotic, uh, even increasingly exotic in, you know, in the difficult times. And I want to talk to you about that. Um, but um, um, how did you, you how did you find your job? You had a job before you left here uh, mm -hmm. to go there. Right. It was a job teaching English. And where was it in China? And how did you connect up with the job? Yeah. So I got a job up in, in Shanghai with uh, Education First. Um, but there's a lot of companies that are constantly hiring foreigners to come out to uh, live in China. The demand for English teachers, foreign English teachers specifically, even ones that don't have very good qualifications, is always really, really high. Uh, so if anybody's interested in doing so, teaching English is a very, very good kind of window into, into that. And even most foreigners living in China today they're English, they're an English teacher. It's by far the most popular profession for foreigners because a lot of things companies would prefer locals. Well, now, does that fall within the, um, the news story two weeks ago about how uh, the Chinese government had um, terminated all tutoring arrangements? You must have heard about that. Mm. One, one fine day, Xi Jinping said, no more tutoring, uh, and we're terminating that whole, you know, area of activity and teaching and you can't do it anymore and it's against the law um how does that affect what you just said sure well one of the big problems that they're having in the market is that the demand for it is so massive that the schools are becoming less and less regulated more and more often they're breaking right now the law says that you can only be from one of about seven countries where the native language is english think that would be things like canada america uh, New Zealand, for example, but a lot of sort of out of the way kind of tutoring schools would start hiring, for example, Russians, or uh, maybe they would even just hire uh, local Chinese, which is not so, which, which they're not supposed to do if they're advertising that we have international teachers here. Um, it's not there's now there still is absolutely a market for private tutoring. But they're starting to put it under new regulation. And I think that has a lot to do with the pressure that the students go under. You know, uh, in China, you take the Gaokao, which is like the college entrance exam. And once you take that test, it's probably going to determine how a lot of your life direction goes. And so there's a huge problem of student stress, huge problem of even student suicide. And I think the government's trying to start taking actions about that. And one of those things is going to involve maybe not, you know, after the kids are done with 10 hours of school, maybe let's not throw them into a tutoring center or at least not give them so much homework out of it. Hmm. You know, my impression, just me now, was that um, this seemed to be part of the government's attempt to control education. Uh, and uh, the government did not want external forces, external educational uh, sources and forces teaching kids, teaching students um, about things other than the party line, literally the party line in school. Um, so therefore let's terminate the tutors so we don't, we don't have a leak in the boat, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Any, any truth to that? Uh, well, make no mistake. If you 
may, or if, if you were doing my job, right, and you started telling the students that um, Taiwan should be its own independent country, you would be at least fired, probably arrested and deported. That's absolutely true. Um, However, I still think that the government realizes that there's important value to having foreigners in, especially foreigners with native English accents. Uh, you know, there's still a very healthy market for foreign uh, adjunct professors who are doing um, a lot of really interesting scientific work. As you know, China is currently outspending us in R&D. Uh, and I think that that's going to continue for, for a very, very long time. And the government is, of course, always going to have kind of their finger on the pulse when it comes to education. But I don't think that it's quite this foreigner crackdown that's kind of made out in Western media. Hmm. We do have a viewer question, Let me, because it does relate to what you just said. I'll read it to you. <clears throat> we appreciate viewer questions. You know, it gives, yeah. gives us a handle on what our viewers are thinking. Um, what has been the private versus public reaction of Chinese people, you were there, you talked to them, so you can say what the reaction was. Uh, reaction to the recent actions taken by the Chinese government concerning business and education in China. And I suspect that inherent in this question is a discussion of Desmond Shum, uh, who wrote a book called Red Roulette, which is about how the culture of Chinese business has changed and how. Um, you have to be very careful if you're doing well in business. Yeah. And, and you know, he was he, he did in a video talk show recently, not with us. I wish it had been with us, <clears throat> where, you know, he talked about uh, how the, the power structure in business had changed. And the state-owned um, enterprises have risen up again. They had declined, but now they've risen up, rock, mm -hmm. risen up again. Um, and it, the hierarchy is all built on how close you are to the government. Mm -hmm. uh, Guanxi has changed. <laughs> Guanxi is now not so much if you know somebody a long time, it's uh, is the person you're dealing with high up in the government. So anyway, uh, but the mm -hmm. question posed is, what is the reaction of the Chinese people that you met, that you, you know, that you talked to? Um, to the, the Chinese government uh, changes in business and education in China. And I suppose that would include the red roulette concept of a change in business culture in China. Mm -hmm. Good question. So um, most Chinese people were, you know, because they went through, they went through standard education that was designed by the party, uh, what they're going to get is sort of the story of beginning in the Maoist era, where we tried complete rejection of all private enterprise. You know, that didn't work out so well. And so the next solution was not quite full openness of, of the market, right? But let's, you know, sort of use the market in, with the goal of controlling it for the common, uh, for the common good or the, uh, the, the further strengthening of China. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes, Private businesses in China do things that are tremendously unpopular. So one example that people will point to is Jack Ma. You know, he was trying to get like Ant Financial going on. But that program in China was actually quite unpopular because many people kind of recognized it as a loan shark program. Mm. It was it, there were like exorbitantly unfair interest rates and people within the China within China were very angry. Another example would be, as you've heard, the Evergrande crisis that's going on with the real estate development, right? A lot of people are in the offices in Evergrande, probably right now, because it's like in the morning in China, screaming at the CEOs that we want our money back. And so I think when these things happen, right, when these things happen where businesses do really bad things, um, it really, really is good for the party in kind of a roundabout way, because suddenly people think like, huh. Maybe Mao Zedong was right about that whole don't fully trust those private businesses kind of thing, right? And so because we're in a cycle like that right now, uh, the, the, especially with those two examples that I've cited about Evergrande and, and Financial, I think that popular support around the party is probably going to be really strong. And that's coupled with the fact that right now there's no obvious screaming horrifying scandals going on within the CPC the way that there are in, for example, uh, Russia or North Korea. 
And so I think in, in a roundabout way, uh, people kind of support the party for this reason. Um, you know, the party, party support is, for the most part, actually quite popular, even when you're talking to uh, people that have completely, like Chinese people that have left China and like even Americanized. Um, they will, they'll still say like, yeah, I think usually, they'll usually say something like, yeah, I think the party's probably trying their best. Uh, and now, of course, you have people that say, no, that they're doing a horrible job. But um, as far as I know, even American-run polls uh, rank the approval of the party is quite high within Chinese people. So did, did you talk to people about these things? You talked oh, yeah. to people about Evergrande and Jack Ma? Well, and, Evergrande, and... I was already gone. Um, Evergrande crisis. That's recent, there. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was very, very But you talked talk to them about to... Jack Ma. So I did talk to can, people can about you, the... Can you validate, um, you know, what the polls were saying? Can you validate what the government was saying about the popularity of Jack Ma's program? Um, uh, yeah. I'll tell you why I'm asking. Sure, sure, sure. I'm, I'm asking because, if, you know, in the early day of Xi Jinping, which is, what, 10 years ago or so, um, he was using... Um, Apparent corruption, because mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it wasn't really corruption at all. Sure. When 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 Joe Bao, when Ji Bao, when Joe Bao is an example of that, mm -hmm. where it was it was a businessman uh, making money, operating within you know the business culture of China, um, but he would seize on this um, one person or or company and use the rubric of corruption in order to make you know him disappear. I mean disappear mm -hmm. from the the business world, or maybe worse. Um, okay, and, and what you had was um, sort of the transformation of the notion of corruption, uh, of the notion of rivalry into a claim of corruption. Okay? Mm -hmm. So one possibility right now is that the same kind of thing is going on in the nature of, well, if it's unpopular with the people, we are going to come down on it. We're going to come down on, on, on Jack Ma. Um, and we're going to use that um, that 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 sheep's clothing of um, you know public um, unpopularity as a way to as a way to reduce Jack Ma. Um, is there any any truth to that? Um, there very well could be. The thing that I think Chinese people have this awareness of is that um, for most for the for the most part, if you're they know if you're a regular person that your influence on the state of society is going to be slim to nothing, right? I mean, this, this, is, this is true, uh, this is true in, in most societies just by law of averages. You know, we can't have everybody running the country at once. Um, and I think what happens is when they see someone like uh, Jack, Ma, uh, Jack Ma, they see somebody that runs the, comp you know, runs the most powerful company in the country, and that they have no actual control over, right? The thing is, if you, contrary to popular belief, you actually can vote in China. You can actually vote on quite a lot of things, right? Uh, but in some, sen in some senses, there are some votes that you have to be a party member for, but there are like 150 million party members. So I think that their logic is, well, at least I have some margin of control over what goes on in the CPC. Um, and with Jack Ma, he's just this billionaire who can do whatever he wants. And maybe they kind of feel that sort of separation from power and that makes them resent a little bit. Now, the other question that you brought up was about, do, does, you know, especially someone like Xi Jinping use corruption to make political en enemies disappear or something, right? There's a lot of uh, micro cases where I think you could, look in, you could look into many, many details for a long, long time. Uh, and I'm not I'm not going to say that, that that does or doesn't happen. Right. But what I will say is corruption really is a massive problem within China, especially at lower levels, uh, paradoxically, because lower levels is where they get money to sort of implement the party program. And then suddenly you find out that all of this money got slushed out to some overseas fund. And so I think the challenge the CPC is kind of facing right now is how do we kind of give the impression how do we kind of convince the world that we really are pursuing corruption uh, without people just immediately go into the cry of like political purge? I think that's the big challenge that they have right now on, on the international scale. How are they meeting that? Are they meeting, are they meeting it successfully? That? That's a great question. 
Um, that's a great question. On some level, I don't think that they care so much. China is a really internal, it, it's, it's a very powerfully internally functioning country in the sense that they believe they are very big on giving other countries their internal sovereignty. So um, when Israel was founded, this is a little known fact, but when Israel was founded, Israel was founded about, about the same time that China was. And China was the first country in Asia to recognize Israel as a real country. And Israel was one of the first countries in the Middle East to recognize China once the Maoist revolution came on, right? When the Taliban took over Afghanistan, China was also one of the first countries on earth to recognize the Taliban as the rightful leaders of Afghanistan. A few weeks so, ago. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I think because they have this attitude of like, you know, um, recognize countries have their own rights to do whatever they want, and they sort of expect the same for themselves because they have this attitude. On some level, I don't think that they care so much if the rest of the world is saying um, this country is corrupt or, or anything like that, because they have their own internal model and they say, you guys go figure out your own model. It's very refreshing to talk to you because, you know, while you were away, increasingly, um, China got involved in all kinds of mm, scuffles. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, for example, with Hong time. Kong and threats on Taiwan, yeah. and the South China Sea disruptions in the South China Sea, disruption, you know, uh, with with the U.S. Uh, and you know, and changing foreign policy stress points in foreign policy. Uh, and um, you know, we we have, we have an image of China as uh, doing debt traps on the on the Belt Road Initiative. We have an image of China suppressing people in Xinjiang, um, oppressing them and worse. We have an image of, of China you know, changing things to make the life of the individual maybe a little, a little less democratic uh, and so forth. <laughs> and I wonder, you know, so you had two years there and during those two years, a lot of these things were happening. Did these things come to your attention? Did they come to the attention of the students that you were teaching? And big question, did you discuss them with the students you were teaching? <laughs> well, I think most of my students were somewhere between the ages of four and seven. So I, I don't know if they're really interested in a conversation about the South China Sea. Um, but it absolutely was, a, you know, you can imagine most of my friends are my age in their, in their mid-20s. And yeah, we would we would actually bring up uh, bring bring that kind of stuff up. I was for a while actually uh, dating a girl. My girlfriend uh, for a, a long time was um, I think she was a half Uyghur, and she was very supportive of the government's action. Even when I would try to, because I was interested in the sort of what the Chinese side of the situation was, right? Because that's not really something you're going to hear in the West, most likely. So I was interested to see what they say. And my girlfriend, it blew my mind how supportive she was, not just of the situation, but if I would try to kind of, you know, you ever try to like prod somebody's beliefs and maybe get them to say like, yeah, okay, but I don't really like that. No, no, she was very, very firm. Like, yeah, there's a terrorism problem in, in, in Xinjiang. We have to fix it. They're trying to make, you know, a sort of a Chinese Sharia within, the, within their own borders. And we're gonna we're gonna make sure that that doesn't that doesn't make a problem anymore. Um, no matter what I tried, I tried to get her to say anything bad about it. She wouldn't. Um, she would, and and it's not and, and and that's the thing. It's not just that she wouldn't. She 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 didn't agree. Is she actively thought of reasons that it was wrong? We, so I didn't suspect it was like kind of hiding her true beliefs. Now, as for the other things, right? I think the biggest thing that was scary to me actually was. Uh, the Chengdu embassy was shut down um, in response to the Houston embassy being shut down by the department. Oh, I remember that. Sure. Yeah. 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 And I remember actually telling my boss, uh, hey, uh, I'm just going to let you know if the Shanghai embassy gets shut down, I'm like first flight out of there. I, I'm not, I, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm not going to consider it a safe place for me. But fortunately, that situation kind of just casually died down quietly. Yeah. Uh, you know, there were really a lot of interesting political developments around that time, and maybe some people would have left. But I think the biggest thing that inspired me to stay was the biggest political event of the world by far, which is COVID, was handled within China inside of a couple of months. Wuhan was declared COVID free. The Wuhan, the origin of the virus, um, was declared COVID free on April 15th. 
And so that kind of made me say, okay, well, no matter- April 15th, like, 2020. 2020, yeah, exactly. So three and a half or so months after the outbreak. And so that made me say, okay, well, even if, you know, things are not maybe so great in uh, international relations, right? China is still the safest place for me to be by far. And that was kind of my logic. So, uh, yeah, so that, uh, that's so interesting. Um, how, do, how do people in China feel, the people you consorted with, how do they feel about the origin? I mean, there's a, you know, huge international debate going on, which, I, which is actually going to go nowhere as we, as we see it, as to whether this was, a, you know, the weaponization of the virus in the Wuhan Virology Institute. Um, or whether it was just uh, present there because somebody got sick or they, or they were working on trying to, um, you know, otherwise deal with it as a medical issue. Um, what do people feel in China? You know, believe it or not, the dominant theory is that it's actually America's fault. Um, there, was a, uh, there was a big military, I think it was, had something to do with the military Olympics that all countries would participate in. And they hosted it in Wuhan in October. And uh, there's many Chinese uh, people. I would mostly talk about this with things like taxi drivers. And the dominant theory was they said like, oh, yeah, it's probably America. There's a fort in, I think, Maryland called Fort Dietrich, where they think the, the actual virus came out of. And then Wuhan, they say, was just the first spot of like outbreak. Now, that's not, that's not, that's probably not what the, uh, I don't know if I would say the majority of people believe that, but a very surprising number of them do. Absolutely none of them would accept the idea that it came out of the virology lab. That's, that's definitely not true. Well, well they, they wouldn't say it's true. I have no idea personally. Uh, but I would say a lot of these things kind of come down to image and blame because I think if America was able, to, for example, to prove that um, China, w through irresponsible virology, uh, created COVID, right? Well, that would open maybe some kind of like international lawsuits. It might say who's responsible for vaccinating the third world. It might have a lot of different other international repercussions. But I think for a lot of it is it's just sort of um, posturing. And it's for a question that's never really going to be satisfied. It's well, for a question I, 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 think I think totally agree. Satisfied. It's never going to be satisfied because mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the CCP is never going to really let us inside that lab, you know. <clears throat> so the question really is um, the propaganda. You know, the taxi driver has been affected by the propaganda. Sure. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, the PRC was, uh, you know, doing propaganda and does propaganda. And, and for a, an American in, in China, like you, being exposed and then you got to learn Mandarin and, and that's really something because then you could see the flow of information or maybe disinformation, the flow of propaganda around you. How yeah. did you keep your head straight about that? You know, because, you know, propaganda, it's, it's pernicious. You, you don't know exactly when it's being thrown at you. Uh, oh, did you. Did you use your critical thinking? Did you have to? In order well, to determine so. what was true and what was not true? Yeah, um, <laughs> I think there's definitely some parts of my personal worldview that were influenced uh, by things that I learned in China that you would, would even push me to what I would call like pro-China, right? The, the definitely there were some parts of my worldview. Like when I was talking to my Uyghur girlfriend about uh, how the situation is not nearly as bad as what everybody is saying, uh, I think there's definitely probably some legitimacy to what she says. Uh, sort of a Western, we get like the Western side of what's going on, but not necessarily what China says is going on. Um, now that's definitely true. But at the same time, there were some things about China where I was actually, by speaking Mandarin, I was actually even more concerned about, with it, about the society. I think one big example is I remember there was a, news article on Baidu that I saw, where it said, as you, as, as you know, there's a big crisis of uh, not having enough single women to, to marry, right? And so if you're 30 because years of all, old- Because and, of all the rules. If well, you're 30 Chinese, years old Chinese woman, like young men, don't they? They like, to, uh, they like to have male babies. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, well, so they're trying to make sure that there's no le uh, what they call leftover women. So if you're, the idea is that there's some like public scrutiny or, or shame to be being a woman that's single over 30. Um, and so I remember, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember reading this article on Baidu that said, um, and, and this was all in Chinese. I would have never known this if I didn't speak Chinese. Uh, if a woman hits 30 and is still single, what biological changes are going to happen to her body? And I remember thinking, what nonsense is this? <laughs> like, what, what are they even talking about here, right? And it became pretty obvious to me. It was just kind of a piece to try to encourage young women to get married as quickly as possible and preferably have a bunch of kids. Um, <laughs> but yeah, def definitely, there, there's, you have to keep your head, um, uh, you have to keep your wits about you. Um, you have to understand that there are some people that have been just fed information for their whole lives and they're never going to change their mind. <laughs> and in, in large part, because, you know, it's possible changing their mind would have a lot of social consequences for them. But even if it didn't, it's a lot to ask, I think, of somebody to completely change their world, their worldviews around something when it's just wouldn't what it's the information that they've gotten all their lives. And that goes for Americans, too. That goes for Americans, too. Right. There's I'm sure there's many people that you know in like your own life that have political views that horrify you and you have to sort of at some point say this is what you've been fed for your whole life and there's just no changing your mind mm, true <clears throat> well let me let me ask you one other thing that's um, relative to that is um you, you said you had to be careful um and i suppose you had to set up your own guardrails so that you didn't run afoul of of the uh, PRC. Mm -hmm. um, what what kind of um, what do you want to call it? Uh, sacred cows were there, uh, and um, did you ever worry about running afoul and and having someone knock on your door and make you um, take you away for retraining? Now let me go further and say and we all saw and you must have seen this too while you were in China the Ming incident. Uh, where at the request of the U.S., uh, Canada detained Meng. Uh, uh, you're, uh, Meng Wanzhou is, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think you're who you're referring to. Meng Wanzhou is the, the CFO from Huawei who was That's arrested. It. That's the one. Yeah. And then yeah. China, in, in, in return, detained the two Michaels, referred mm -hmm. to as the two Michaels, uh, you know, for no reason at all, but just, just sort of a tit for tat kind of thing. Well, uh, they this, they accused this is... them of they accused them of drug smuggling, um, mm. okay. and I and like I said, I okay, but I'm I'm sorry, I I I, I should I shouldn't interrupt. Oh, no, no, I think I think that's a you know that's an appropriate piece of information, mm. <laughs> but um, you know there you are in a situation where there are geopolitical frictions, sure. uh, where any day, you know, because of something you said or did. Or something you didn't say or do, you could be on the wrong side of the curve. Uh, how did you deal with that? Were you concerned about that? You know, I, I will admit to you, for the first couple of months, I was concerned that I would like get a knock on my door um, for like for like even what I would consider at the time relatively minor, uh, like even, even like a question or something. I was I was kind of concerned about that. Eventually, I kind of got the sense that. Uh, probably no one really cares. Um, now, the big thing I think that China does to exercise social control um, is not even like arresting people for saying bad things on the internet. Not that that never happens. I'm sure that there's some except there's some cases of it. But I think the big thing that is why you don't, for example, see a lot of conversations about Tiananmen Square, for example, right? Is at the end of the day most Chinese people don't want to talk about something like that, right? Like if, if, or if you, were, if you were going to talk about like um, maybe some, something you didn't like about the party, uh, probably most of your friends would say something like, why are you talking about that? What, why, why, this, is, this, is such, this is such silly political nonsense. Let's go back to drinking baijiu or throwing darts or, or doing something more interesting, right? I think a lot of Chinese people in this sense are actually quite apolitical. Um, and that may be because their system allows for 
less ease of access into politics. And maybe that's not always such a bad thing because you know when we when what they would say is that when you get hyper involvement in put in politics like regular people get hyper involved in politics you get things like uh what, what what was the what was the name of the guys in michigan that tried to kidnap the governor revolution yeah like some some kind of weird revolutionary type thing where people uh, where they would say yeah we're doing this because of our political freedom so we want to kidnap the governor and remove all the COVID restrictions, right? Um, I think to Chinese people that this is not freedom to them. This is not how they want to engage in their political society. And so that's the big way that I kind of control it. It's not even that I have to, as I'm talking, I have to think like, oh God, am I saying something that's going to get me thrown into prison, right? I more actually think to myself, am I saying something that the person is even going to want to hear or uh, or have some kind of interest in. Because at the end of the day, Chinese people, I think, don't really want to hear about a foreigner's opinion on why they're on like problems with their country. I think that's the really big thing about it. Mm, it's it's less it's less of a political control thing and more of more of a it's it's the classic thing about, you know, you can insult your family members, but if other people do it, you're gonna get really angry. I think Chinese people have the same view when they talk about their government versus they hear a foreigner talking about their government. Did they did they like you as an oh, American? Did they did they like America? Yeah, yeah, they had quite positive uh, outlooks on America. They loved American culture. They liked me. I guess um, I you know I look like it, I look like an American. There's really no way, nothing else to say about it. <laughs> um, they they all of them were listening to Taylor Swift and Justin Bieber and the um, bubble tea shops and the little mini restaurants and i'd even ask them once in a while like hey do you understand this music that's going on in the background and they said no i have no idea what it's saying <laughs> but could you go back would you go back andrew yeah i i i really did have a great time and honestly i think that for a lot of people i would strongly recommend if you're just get it just getting out of college you got a kid coming out of college do a year abroad teach english get a simple job, even a job that doesn't pay that much, the experience will be invaluable to you, especially if you find yourself picking up the local language. It's gonna be a really, really great thing to sort of develop your own personal character. Uh, and I really, really think that it, even if somebody can't accept, for example, China, which I understand, maybe you have like just in irreconcilable political differences, go to Japan. Go to Korea, go to somewhere in Barcelona. You, there's, there's tons of places on earth and a year grand scheme of things, not that much time. And you will find that there is invaluable things that you get for it for the rest of your life. Ah, go West, young man. Go West. Go west. Or East in my chance. <laughs> or, well, <laughs> you should travel West to get to the East. That's true. That's true. Horace Greeley said that. Okay, I have one more. One last question about that um um yeah i i just want to know what was the thing that you learned you know there you are an auger play an impressionable young man you were 23 at the time you you left and went over there for all the reasons we've discussed and and you had a rich experience you learned the language you met people you had relationships really, really important for anyone. But but question, you know, what was the thing that changed you? How are you changed um, now that you come back? I suspect that Mandarin is going to be a useful skill for the rest of my life, even if it's not something applied professionally. Um, language skill is not necessarily something you need to monetize, which I think is the, a bad idea that a lot of us have. But you know, I find personal intense joy when I'm just watching a soap opera or something and I fully understand everything that's going on. Past that, I would also say uh, an appreciation for working very, very hard because Chinese people, I don't know if you've heard of the uh, 996 schedule, but that's what a lot of them have to do where they work from 9 a.m., 9 p.m., six days a week. Uh, and that is a really good way to have some perspective, I think, on your own life and suddenly makes your situation look 
not so bad. But an appreciation, I think, for uh, the work ethic is also a really, really valuable skill that I hope to, um, I hope to really, that I do hope I implement into my own career. You know, I, in my first trip to China, I was just amazed. Came back from the airport and we're looking at these buildings going up and there are lights from the welding torches on these skyscraper buildings. And it was two o'clock in the morning. And I'm saying these, these guys are working all night long to build that building. I've never seen that kind of vitality, that kind of work ethic, that kind of you know, commitment to getting the job done. Uh, were you impressed? Did you see that too? Oh my goodness. Yeah, everywhere. And not just with, uh, not just with workers, actually. Um, one of the things that really surprised me was that old people, you know, senior citizens have a really, really strong volunteering system that they do over there. So I remember on my first trip to Nanjing, I saw a line of like 50 uh, older people that were doing like hedge art. Have you ever seen a hedge art where they like have a giant like hedge, um, like, a, like, a, like a big shrub and people like cut shapes into it? Um, there were like 50 old people that were working on it. And the next day we came by that same, that same place. It was this beautiful dragon. Um, that's that's a really really cool thing to see, and it shows that like people not just have the work ethic that I was talking about, uh, even when they're you know into their retirement age, but it also shows really really valuable community involvement, which is one of the things that's great about Hawaii, and I think also probably one of our as you know we're very Asian inspired, and I think a lot of that uh, community sense that we have from Hawaii comes from comes from that part of the world. I'm so glad you went, Andrew, and I'm so glad you came back. And I'm uh, so glad you had the, the, the interface you had, the rich experience you had. And, and I, actually, I, I would like to uh, continue our discussion in another show. I have so many questions to ask you, um, you know, because uh, sometimes, you know, you need to talk to somebody like you who has been on the ground to, to really fully appreciate a place. So, uh, uh, Sai Jin, for now. <laughs> and we will meet again in Shishu. Go away. Shishu, you may join our program. Of course. Of course. I hope you like it. May I say the same to you, Andrew? <laughs> oh, no, I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to everybody watching. I just said, everybody, thank you for watching our program, and I hope that you liked it. <laughs> thank you, Andrew. <laughs>